Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Future Friday, we're going to talk about cryogenic air energy storage. So let's dive right into it. Now before we understand why the heck we are working with something as convoluted as cryogenic air energy storage system, we have to understand what is our problem. Well, our problem is that we are utilizing renewables and at this point in time, I'm not even joking that in India, you can buy a 5 kilowatt generator or you can buy a 5 kilowatt solar plant. Both are of the same cost. So you can understand this. Realistically speaking, at this point in time, it's much cheaper to make renewables than uh, basically non-renewables. However, all renewable energy, be it a wind, be it a tidal, be it a, uh, solar, it has uh, what we call intermittency, meaning it pro provides power when it wants, not uh, on your schedule. It's not like a coal power plant where it's like, oh, oh power load is up, open the turbine, uh, you know, open the steam valve, more steam, more RPM, more energy. No, it does not work like that. So that is a very serious issue. Our grid does not have any way to store excess energy uh, when it's needed so that creates a very huge demand for huge energy storage now be very mindful i'm not talking about kilowatts i'm not even talking about megawatt i'm talking gigawatt as in at least 1000 uh, megawatt energy capacity so that's the reality of it now you may be the first thing you may think lithium ion yes you can do that physics is not stopping you however the cost per megawatt will start to go up so high that it would be very problematic to do that and on top of that non all lithium uh, chemistry are fire stable meaning if you utilize uh, uh, basically tesla power packs they are vulnerable to fire meaning one malfunction can literally set all this thing on fire so uh, that's not desirable especially for something that you know you want to put it and forget it for next 25 years you do want things that are what we call passively safe meaning if humans do stupid things around it it should still survive so lithium does not uh, you know scale up to gigawatt now you may be like what about if you make bigger factories bigger power plants no it will still not simply because there is a lot more demand of lithium as in lithium needs to be either go to uh, grid storage or your car car is far more expensive per uh, basically per kilogram of lithium that is spent there so people want to spend it on uh, basically car it will make it will be more profitable for the company selling the lithium that will drive up the demand the cost will go up so fundamentally at gigawatt like one or two can be done and i'm pretty sure by the time uh, we are off of lithium system we will have at least 10 20 large scale as in like multi gigawatt capacity system but it will fade out simply because it's just too non-feasible for that economics wise economics is like that it's really not that good now the only way as of now we know for storing gigawatt scale energy as in like two gigawatt three gigawatt we it's pumped hydro basically pumped hydro does have this one uh, annoying thing is that it has to be very location specific meaning you have to find a place where you have adequate amount of water that's achievable but you also need a very adequate amount of uh, height so you are creating potential height difference these two things combined is very rare and not to mention they do take huge amounts of land as in almost like a small power dam so the energy requirement the construction time all those things considered these puppies are huge expensive slow to build and uh, they have a footprint they're like you will know that this is a giant system so that's not practical everywhere most of the places do not ha have the same not because they do not have the technology to build this we have been building this from 1950s for crying out loud but most places do not have the required uh, components to like oh do you have height accessible do you have that place where top is also accessible bottom is also accessible, and you have infinite supply of water yeah that's the reality of it then you may think like how about compressed air now compressed air does work that's awesome but it also requires natural gas pockets now you're like why the heck you want to use natural not gas tanks compressed air in a gas tank is a boom device meaning any fault any corrosion will literally translate to and i mean seriously as in compressed air tank when they go especially when you're talking about grid scale system the tanks would be huge and will have insane amount of kinetic energy into them so that's a fundamentally flawed system and then why do you want to use natural pockets well we know for a fact when we drilled for oil some places had natural gas and at very high psi very high bar pressures and they never leaked they did not leak for centuries so we know for a fact that's the most stable place where we can put very high compressed air and it will stay there for as long as we want so that's awesome that's why it's also very location specific and if you are like no i will i want to make my own tanks yes it can be done physics is not stopping you but first that's very risky and second it's idiotically expensive so that's the problem that's why we are looking into liquid air batteries or cryogenic energy storage system so as the idea behind this well cry cryogenic energy storage system does allow you to have uh, basically pumped hydro level energy density as in like how much megawatt you can generate and for how long both can be done anywhere basically you are middle of a desert you have a huge solar farm you want to stabilize this output Ta-da! don't think about it you are placing a where you have like a lot of tidal energy and you want to stabilize that energy output 
Ta-da, don't think about it. So that's the reality of it. Another aspect, it does not require complex chemistry. At this point in time, if you have been following renewable energies, you would be frustrated by every Tom, Dick and Harry is complaining. He was like, you know, I'm going to make this battery. This is going to replace the world. I'm going to make this battery. This is going to save the world. It's like there is a now running meme at this point in time, you know, solid state battery can do everything except leave the lab. So that's the reality of it. It's very easy to say, oh, this can happen. But in real life, lithium ion that we take for granted nowadays, it started from 1990s. It takes years years before something like from lab to mass production to actual mass production to actually feasible mass production where it's profitable to make that takes very long time so any technology that's even good as in like it's really good it will still take 30 years to reach a market where it's feasible economically speaking so that's why whenever somebody shows you a chemical option be very skeptical of that not that it cannot be done is the process of doing it is very long fundamentally it's very long like lead acid battery is 100 years old so let that sink in it's not just uh, we randomly reach oh let us it that's how gonna be utilized for 100 years no people over time brick by brick we spent on it refined it figured things out that's how we did same with lithium ion so any new technology that's in lab right now will still take that mind, uh, amount of time so this puppy has no complex about there is nothing complex about it it's just a mechanical system and it has very small footprint and that's another desirable aspect if you utilize a compressed air system and you have a reliability it's like you know we're gonna have very awesome tanks and it's in a desert so corrosion damage is very minimal and we're gonna be like you know very careful with it maintain it and all that the tank size would be huge you're gonna have hectares of land wasted for that so that's another aspect you want the footprint to be lost so if you want to uh, buy a plot of land for your solar farm you do not want to spend like half of it you know just for energy storage you want to have as much solar farm as possible and as little for energy storage as possible so this puppy can achieve that another aspect is every component of this puppy is an industrial unit meaning you can literally pick up the phone and be like abb can you give me a like you know cryogenic tanks they're like i got you fam then you can call up siemens hey can you give us the steam turbine that we need for this yeah they're like got you fam there are hundreds of companies that is building components and in every continent there is like one or two manufacturers so it's not even like oh only in europe everywhere even in india it's like we got this we got this that's another aspect and the pre-existing supply chain makes it like the moment you design the thing it's like we're gonna do this utilizing this this component it will take two three years to assemble it's almost as fast as solar farms so that's the amazing aspect of cryogenic energy basically uh, the founder the ceo of this company specified it like it's just pumped hydro that you can take anywhere and i like that idea so let's understand how this magic works <sighs> So this puppy works with compression. So when you have excess energy or you have uh, you're generating energy, but nobody is demand, uh, you know, taking it off from the grid. Grid will uh, go into what we call power containment, meaning you will shut down the supply, uh, shut down production, so to say. You do never want to do that. You will lose money for that. So you're like, OK, this puppy is like, I got this. It's going to basically absorb energy from the grid and compress air out of that. OK, awesome. Now, if you know for anything about compression, you know for a fact that not only it takes a lot of energy, it also creates a lot of heat. So that heat would be collected in water tanks known as uh, basically hot thermal store so you are compressing energy energy cannot be or destroyed so if you are pumping let's say two megawatts in the compressor uh, one mega would be just in the heat so you are collecting that puppy for efficiency reasons then you have this puppy is completely independent okay now after you have compressed clean air you have to liquefy it now liquefying is also uh, gonna create a lot of waste heat but not as much as uh, basically what you got in compressor now it will still be heat but it will be one of those things where it's like you know hot in Kelvin not in Celsius it's as in so this will be like you know 50 Kelvin or 50 Kelvin is too low basically uh, minus 100 degrees Celsius you still have heat but it's like you know it's not as hot so you're gonna have an independent system which we classify this is what they are calling their patented proprietary system high grade cold storage so that refrigeration is gonna take compressed clean air and liquefy it make it into primarily liquid nitrogen and have heat output that heat that they are calling it uh, you know high grade cold storage cold simply because from our touch point of view if you touch that puppy your hand is gonna be bye bye so that's gonna store in this puppy second system now second system i could not find any exact detail but the best understanding i have on based on pdfs that i read that this is a uh, basically rocks now you're like why the heck you are utilizing rock as a thermal material they are very good at low temperature if they use like you know minus 50 degrees Celsius on water water is gonna freeze and blow up your pipes so that's the energy recovery so you have primary energy recovery secondary energy recovery at this point in time now you have a liquid nitrogen that you will store in cryogenic energy storage so that's step one step two step three is your energy is being charged this is your energy uh, cryo tanks and this is what they are selling as like you know if you want more capacity as in like more megawatt hour just iron cryo tank that's true and false 
true yes it can be done false if you only do that you will have energy efficiency of 25 percent basically you charge 100 megawatts you can only sell back 25 megawatts for this reason these things also have to be scaled up so if you want to make a bigger plant or bigger capacity these things also needs to scale up so they can absorb the waste heat because without this waste heat the system efficiency is too low 25 percent and with this thing they are uh, expecting uh, around 50 to 60 percent efficiency where it starts to become economically viable so you must scale these two things so practically speaking they requires three tank upgrade cold storage upgrade uh, hot storage upgrade and then of course the cryogenic upgrade so now you have charged the battery you basically you had a lot of excess energy in the grid which nobody was using you utilize run the compressor you run the refrigeration and you have liquid energy okay now solar farm is done it's night time and there is a cricket match everybody is going yellow on their tv so your power demands goes ludicrously high now this puppy is gonna go into evaporation stage you open the valves, evaporation is ready. Now, any liquid that is going to evaporate is going to become cold. Now, to make it process efficient, you want to dump energy into it. So, it evaporates very uh, awesomely. So, uh, anything that is going to take energy, uh, dump energy into the system will get cold. So, this high grade cold storage is going to dump energy into the system. In that process, it's going to become cold, which is going to help you in next refrigeration cycle. That's the whole point. The whole energy cycle is locked, looped, so to say. So, uh, it's going to evaporate. Now, your liquid nitrogen is in gaseous phase and the when you know you take any liquid and you evaporate to gas it absorbs energy this puppy became cold this will help you into your next cycle but at this point in time the pressure gas is just gas it's not as powerful as you want to run a turbine then you're going to utilize the warm puppies basically hot thermal stove and this is going to go through a heat expander and that's going to basically take the psi of let's say 15 psi and it's gonna go it to 300 psi or 500 psi or whatever they need it to and now you have high pressure nitrogen and that puppy can go into turbine and give you gg amounts of energy so that's the whole point so this is the these two components are the critical aspect of this any tom dick and harry could have made cryogenic energy storage system the reason nobody did it is simply because it was 25 percent efficient and what this people have figured out basically they have been working for 18 years at this point in time is how to optimize that uh, waste energy recovery system so they have hot water that is efficient for high temperatures and they have uh, basically rock sto uh, stone system for high grade cold storage system now i still don't get it why they call it high grade cold storage it's like it's still um, hot it's still hot it's like you know low temperature heat but i get it just like uh, from marketing point of view it makes it more awesome like you know say we have patented uh, high grade cold storage so that's how this whole system works you have air you clean that puppy you remove water vapor from it you remove carbon dioxide from it then you compress the hell out of it you get heat out of it and compressed air compressed air go to refrigeration you get the same thing you get heat output it and liquefied nitrogen liquefied nitrogen is stored and then when you need to you know extract energy out of it you evaporate utilizing the the energy you got from refrigeration and to make it more powerful you utilize the thermal heat that you got from compression stage and then you run the cycle so that is the high view energy design now be mindful they are as being proprietary so i do not know they may maybe they utilizing some different kind of oil some different kind of rock system that's the best i could find so what's the reality of this puppy well the reality is many uh, systems are under construction at this point in time and uh, there is a lot of demand for that simply because there was a pilot project that was built uh, like a, a few years ago that was 350 kilowatt be mindful that the, when they made 350 kilowatt if you have said anybody we're gonna have a future where we're gonna have 350 kilowatt lithium ion people would have laughed but like uh, that's how big it was for its time and it had 2.5 megawatt hour capacity that's still good that is like a lot of energy and this can be utilized in two ways either as a grid stabilizer or energy storage grid stabilizer is like you know you want to make sure the frequency never goes uh, like say most of the world 50 hertz and in usa 60 hertz so in those sort of scenario you can utilize, utilize this puppy just as a stabilizer it's like you know very good stabilizer now that was the pilot project now be mindful pilot project was not very efficient they were only achieving uh, practical efficiencies of 40 percent and uh, that's also kind of fake simply because they had uh, it attached to another power plant that was utilizing biogas so utilizing the waste heat from that biogas they uh, you know in the expansion stage of uh, liquid nitrogen nitrogen i'm saying basically gaseous nitrogen they want to pressurize the nitrogen they were using that heat so that's why the efficiency was so high so their claims of like 50 60 percent efficiency is only predicated on the fact that you're going to make it huge the bigger you make it the the more easier it will be so in Crington uh, Crington UK they're gonna build a plant that's gonna have 50 megawatt uh, basically power output and 250 megawatt hour capacity aka for around four five hour capacity 50 megawatt for five hours that's good 
then they're gonna build another plant in vermont uh, be mindful all the plants that i'm talking about they already sold the land and people are already starting to uh, lay out the plant design because everything about this is just which uh, company we're gonna order for tanks which company we're gonna order the liquefier and all that jazz. So, like everything is just plan order design and configure and build Vermont USA is also this 50 megawatt unit, but that is 400 megawatt hour capacity. Meaning, uh, basically, Vermont will have the capacity, a battery bank that can run at 50 megawatt for almost four hour, uh, eight hours. So they are going for eight hour capacity, and that's the whole thing. And they can even stre uh, stretch it up. So if let's say Vermont is like, hey, 50 megawatt is awesome, but we want you know nine or ten hour, they can literally add more tanks, all three tanks, basically cryogenic tank cold storage tank and hot storage tank and then they can you know extend this puppy to 400 500 600 whatever they want and if they did not extend the you know cold and uh, warm storage system all they're gonna get is like you know 25 percent efficiency so they have to do that and it does come with one of the side effects that it's not suitable for small scale so if you are thinking oh i'm gonna do this in my off-grid system no like if they, the first stage system they built 350 kilowatt that was not efficient at all like this system is the more bigger you make it the more practical it becomes so fundamentally they, if you go to them and it's like i want 10 megawatt system they're like uh, should you try contacting you know tesla we are not very good at that but the moment you start to talk about 100 megawatt they're like gg 500 megawatt gg and they are like uh, they have plans for like you know 20000 uh, megawatt hour capacity basically 20 gigawatt hour capacity that would be big enough where it can like you know that state i got this man like if you have that kind of energy storage system you can just uh, have renewable today and don't even think about it it's like just add as much wind as you want as much solar as you want and don't think about anything else have biogas add added to it just for lols and uh, it does suffer that low if efficiency may be a turn off for you and especially it is for a small scale system that is why like in small scale they will simply say no no thank you uh, and be mindful when you're talking about grid scale that's acceptable losses because pumped hydro is almost at the same level so now on paper you mean like hey pumped hydro is just pumping water up and letting it down it never works that way in real life it's always lossy so reality is 50 60 percent efficient is like you can easily sell them and if you're like dude this is pumped hydro but you can put it anywhere they're like shut up and take my money and if you can exceed 60 percent of it, which they specified it's not impossible to do the bigger the plant the more easier it will be to make it more efficient more more looped more uh, you know limited system it's doable but it's just like you know uh, megawatt per hour uh, dollar price will go up that's why uh, that's a uh that's their limited rate like they all their research was to make sure the efficiency is locked at 50 60 percent because at that point it's far more financially viable so reality of this puppy is very good so what we can expect in the future at this point in time this is one of the best technology i have seen for large scale system there are other systems that i'm like you know liquid metal battery i'm like again super complex chemistry and every tom is like we would have done it five years 10 years later still waiting for that thing it's almost like fusion it's like you know ne next 30 years so reality is this is one of those things where i'm like oh you are just fine-tuning things that we already have and you're configuring them in the way that we want to pumped hydro is a real thing it's a real thing it's just pumped hydro for the temperature so i uh, really like the probability of it succeeding is very high on top of that it also has a few core advantage advantage being charge and discharge is free of each other what does that mean that simply means you can charge the system while you're discharging it both can work at simultaneously so you could even have a scenario where it's like hey uh, i have a huge solar farm okay you have gg amounts of solar gg amounts of wind turbine but you all you are running is like you know small village out of it you can just literally have a very high power uh, you know charging step basically uh, the air liquefaction section you have very huge units there but your generator our unit is like only 10 megawatt bro just chill chill like you know uh, they barely consume 8 megawatt 10 megawatt is more than enough and if we ever need it in future we can add it so that is awesome that charging and discharging are independent of you can have a scenario where it's like you know wind farms that's like always over producing let's say you're like hey charge station make it as big as well discharge we don't need it just you know and then power and capacity those are also independent which is also a desirable factor you may not always want like you know megawatt hour capacity because that requires a very big substation to handle it so you may be like hey dude all i need is 50 megawatt is more than good enough to run most of the places uh, like small places i'm not talking about like you know metropolitan but small places more than good enough. 50 megawatt is a serious amount of energy but we do want it like you know for eight hours or ten hours or in case of solar if you are only relying on solar you're talking about like uh, four times that so 15 to 4 you can do that uh that's the reality of it that can be done so you or you can even have your days like dude we have this awesome uh, plant uh, coal power plant which works is amazing but we just need some buffer you know in case we need to ramp up and ramp down because steam turbine ramp up and ramp down is very slow so this puppy is like i got this i got this it can be done so you will not have huge tanks but you will have huge turbines and generators 
So this is awesome. And another aspect is it adds spinning mass to the grid. Now grid is stabilized simply because of gyroscopes. As in all the turbines that you see in uh, power plants, they are huge. As in 100 tons to hundreds of tons and hundreds of tons of generator also. So reality is these spinning mass is so massive, so much inertia is there. Once they are spinning at 60 Hertz, like uh, let's say their frequency is generated from a two, four pole uh, generator unit, they will be like 1500 RPM. They're not gonna slow down no matter what you do. Like you, you can put a giant induction furnace in the load and it will barely slow it down. Now that barely slow it down is enough that it slows it down, computer detects it. That frequency will start to go from, let's say 50 Hertz, it will start to go to 49.99. Computer is like, whoa, 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 somebody is putting load, open the steam valve, the RPM will be back up. That's why we love spinning masses. Now like how the heck solar power plant does that? It does not. That's the problem. Uh, what we have synthetic grid. When you are talking about wind, uh, wind system, they are synthetic grid. They do not have spinning mass that is directly coupled as a physical mass. You want power plants. You want something that is huge as spinning mass that creates a very stable system. And utilizing this, other systems like other ba power battery backup system or what we call grid tie inverters, they can work efficiently if they have good spinning mass. So this is another add-on system. Even if you are going all YOLO on solar, all YOLO on wind, you need some spinning mass to stabilize your grid. And this puppy is like, I got this. I got this. You can just have a unit which is like only 50 megawatt, but it has like a huge flywheel just for that sake. It's like, you know, this is a buffer that is making sure the frequency is always stable. So that can be done. That's also another advantage. And no new technology is needed. Not the validium or this or that or fuel cell or like, you know, hydrogen boom potential. Nothing. Everything needed for that is already exists. They are just configuring it. And it's actually doable because the, that's the amazing part about this company is like, yeah, we already built it. Not that we have a contracted one. No, we already built it. We are building a real world practical plant. They had a pilot plant. They built a real one that is connected to the grid. Now they are working on an even bigger plant. So doability factor of this puppy is really good. And the bigger they make it, the more cost effective it becomes. So I can easily see this puppy becoming a really good tool for our uh, you know future. So this was my presentation on liquid air battery. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike. Press it twice to show me your disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.